Uh, so thanks for joining us everyone. Um, this evening is the second um, in our series of monthly online artist talks. Um, these talks are part of the Sustainable Darkroom project um, for which we ran a digital residency um, kind of in research and development throughout the month of April. Um, some of the methods and ideas that we developed during this month are all available to check out on our website and kind of Instagram page. Um, this residency was really generously supported by the Arts Council England, so thanks to them for that. Um, so the Sustainable Darkroom Project, in case any of you guys aren't really aware, is a series of residencies, talks and workshops which have been set up to give practitioners the chance to develop and research and share approaches really to helping them foster um, a more sustainable and environmentally darkroom photographic practice. Um, so it's really a delight to have this evening um, three artists who all kind of fall under the realm of the sustainable darkroom join us. Um, I'll introduce them in order of speaking. So first we're going to have um, Hazel Davies joining us. Hazel is a Hampshire based artist who works primarily with photography. Uh, her work explores materiality of photographs and uses mainly analog and alternative processes with a particular focus on Polaroid film. Um, then we've got Jem speaking. Jem is based in Oxford and works in the Department of Plant Sciences at Oxford University. Uh, she recently completed her MA in photography at Falmouth University, where she undertook practical research into the botanical archives of the Oxford University herbaria. And then lastly, we've got William Arnold speaking. William is based in Cornwall and he's interested in the layers of human and natural history that compromise that comprise the making of the landscape and the role played by the photograph in documenting time and change, the subjective and objective politics of places and their histories. So um, each artist will give a roughly 20 minute talk um, and we'll have some time for questions at the end so if you hold any questions you have for each artist until then um, and then we'll if you everyone keeps their mics on mute for now and then when the questions come at the end you're welcome to unmute yourselves and ask away so um, now I'll hand over to Hazel okay thank you um, just wanted to say thanks for um, inviting me to talk today as well and uh, just hope everyone watching is uh, safe and well. Um, I'm going to uh, just share my uh, work with you today which is my Polaroid manipulations project um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I make my work and the research that went into my work um, so just going to go through it with you. Um, yeah, so for me, I've been really um, it, sort of the history of photography is what's really kind of inspired me um, and early photography. And it all started when I um, was reading Walter Benjamin's uh, brief short history of photography when I was doing my master's degree. Um, and in that kind of Benjamin talks about uh, the, you know, the oranges of photography when it was sort of uh, these, you know, people striving independently to, uh, what's he say? Yeah, de de Nietzsche and Daguerre striving independently towards the same goal, that is to capture images in the camera obscura, which has certainly been known since Leonardo's time, if not before. So we've got this sort of idea coming out of that, that, you know, we already had the camera obscura that had been around a lot longer. And it was only when images were actually fixed that this invention of photography had been declared. So that was something that really struck a chord with me that maybe it wasn't really the, the camera necessarily in that sort of technology, but it was the chemistry. And as somebody who's worked in the dark room, that really resonated with me, this idea that, you know, it was capturing that image and being able to fix it, to keep it, you know, that preserving of a moment. Um, and that was something that, you know, really sparked me off. So. Benjamin says in uh, his essay, he says, the prime of photography 
occurs in its first decade and it was getting it coming down to this idea of people you know working independently trying to find a chemical that can sort of preserve this uh this image um so i also was looking at um got a book by uh, moriyama white and vinegar um and in that he was saying uh if the printing paper film and develop it all vanished from the world i will purchase a whole lot of egg whites and vinegar apply the whites and vinegar on some board around put anything on it and bring it under the sunlight to make rayograph or as we know photograms uh, some of you might not know the term rayograph um and it just got me thinking this idea again that you know photographers we all kind of striving something that experimental when we work in the dark room a lot of us like working with the chemistry and with the processes and you know his quote as well made me think about how today photography is so relevant so many people take images and i was thinking if we didn't have photography now if it hadn't been invented i think we would we would invent it again now um you know so it's kind of just really sparked that and i'm thinking as well with a lot of people in lockdown i've noticed so many photographers now are doing lumen prints they're doing pinhole photography solography it's kind of we're all working with what materials we can get our hands on i think there's something when you work with analog processes that you kind of that tactile uh, process becomes really significant to you and you know you want to kind of work with it and i think a lot of people if they haven't got access to the dark room that's not sort of the end of they're kind of keen to keep experimenting and i think it reminds me again of those early photographers that there's something in us that we want to keep experimenting and trying to capture these images um so i was again going back to that um quote about the prime of photography being in its first decade i started looking at early photographs and early processes and i was looking at uh, photographers now that are using uh wet plate photography um and i started looking at uh joni sternbach's images because i love these images of these surfers and i was going back to them and suddenly i was not interested in her absolutely beautiful pictures i wasn't interested in the subject at all but i became really obsessed with these little sort of process artifacts on the edges of the plates you know the fingerprints the marks where the chemistry has been um just got really sort of yeah into that and um there was a talk on youtube that i watched by ellen susan who also uses um wet collodion and she said that she wanted i wanted to emulate not a subject matter or an idea but a process because it seemed the process itself had something to say and i thought that was you know for me that was again another really significant um you know quote that really resonated with me um so again looking at more people working with uh wet collodion uh there's another brilliant talk by francesco mustalia um, which is available on youtube wet collodion in the digital age um and in that he talks about uh that moment he describes it the, the magic of photography and this magical moment that photographers see when they're in the dark room for the first time and the print is in the tray and that image starts to you know it starts to appear right in front of your eyes in the tray um so he said they saw that print and this is him talking about his uh, friends when they first were in the dark room they saw that print that image come up in the developer it was this magical moment the magic of photography and i used to work um for about five years i worked as a studio portrait photographer um, in a really busy fast paced environment um, and i was just constantly shooting images we could shoot thousands of images a day and it was this kind of churning out of images um, that i felt in that environment myself i just didn't click with what i kind of enjoyed about photography um, and i was feeling more and more dissatisfied with using digital cameras and you know i really miss that kind of that darkroom experience so again this quote just kind of really brought home to me how important analog processes are for me compared to using digital um so again another thing that really kind of 
uh, inspired me was uh, this quote by Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, which, sorry, Laszlo moholy which is the main instrument of photography is not the camera, but the photosensitive layer. Um, so again, it was this idea coming back to perhaps the camera isn't the most important thing, but it's, for me, it's the chemistry. There's a lot of um, this research that I found, a lot of people talking about the chemicals and the photosensitivity that's important and you know like not so much the camera itself um so when i started thinking about how i was gonna bring all of these things into a piece of work um i started thinking about polaroid photography um that for me was something where most people i think have experienced that magic moment of watching an image develop in front of them you know don't have to have the dark room but i think people kind of they associate that they know that they have the polaroid a lot of people have seen that they've used polaroid film maybe um so that felt quite significant to me um i also really wanted uh something to be tactile so again polaroids are associated with this object um and i think i really wanted to move away from this sort of digital idea and find something that was tactile so polaroid kind of resonated with me in that way um, again, I knew it needed to be cameraless. That was something I, I knew at this point I was going to work with the film and the, the materials, but I wasn't going to kind of produce uh, traditional photographs because I didn't want to use a camera. Um, ideally, at this point, I wanted to do maybe some kind of uh, wet plate or tin type photograms. Um, but the cost just, I didn't have the resources, I didn't have the money to do that, it wasn't available to me at that point in time. Um, I've since discovered uh, Michael, uh, I think his name is pronounced Kerner, Michael Kerner's work, and he actually produces these incredible images that are all cameraless, just using uh, the chemistry and these kind of process artifacts to create work. So um, do check out his work, I really recommend it. Um, so this is just showing you um, how I started creating my images. So most of you might have seen how you can just do these sort of Polaroid manipulations where you burst the chemistry uh, at the bottom of the film and you can kind of smush it around with your fingers or whatever tools you use. I kind of find all sorts of things that are used for that, fingers, pens, uh, random things like beads or you know whatever comes to hand that different things kind of leave different patterns. Um, but then what I started to do was to cut open the film because I wanted to kind of get into it and see the chemicals. So um, what I did was I cut off the borders and I opened it up. Um, and inside you've got sort of the acetate sheet that's the front part of the image and then you've got this backing paper. Um, and what I found was when I cut that open, the image sort of stopped developing. Uh, if I left it and waited, they kind of develop and they got lighter and lighter and actually a lot of that information was lost. So I found that getting it to a point where I felt happy with the image and sort of timing it, working out when it was the best time to open it, it kind of like fixed the image, it sort of preserved it as it was, it stopped it developing. So I, I thought that was really um, significant that it kind of comes back to this you know, darkroom process of fixing and this idea of, um, you know, when images were fixed, that that was the invention of photography. So it all kind of tied together for me. Um, so what I've got here is um, this sort of backing paper with the chemistry on. And then on the acetate, it was like a sort of an, almost a, you know, a positive and a negative because you've got these two parts that kind of open up like a, like a butterfly print. And the, um, the acetate sheet, when you hold it to the light, the light comes through. So I decided that that was very much to me like using a negative. Um, so I was playing with this idea of then having a positive and a negative version of the same image. So from one um, Polaroid image, once I've cut it open, I've now got two um, and one that the light comes through and one that is almost more painterly. Um, so you can see here, these are just some of the acetate sheets and one where I'm holding it to the light and you can see the light coming through. Um, 
so what I then started doing was scanning them, using them in the way that I would use a negative. Um, so this is how I think of the materials. Um, once I scan them, I put them into Photoshop and then I invert them again digitally. So I actually end up with uh, four images from each, uh, from each one Polaroid uh, sheet. So I kind of wasn't sure whether to use the Photoshop to kind of invert them, but that's the only digital editing I'm doing. And I think that's pretty much to me still very much the same as any kind of analog process is just the straight inversion, positive to negative reversal. So I didn't really feel too conflicted about doing that. Um, and I end up with the four images. Um, I decide not to display the four together because you end up with this weird kind of Andy Warhol-esque look with these sort of four different colours and you can't get away from that kind of association with Andy Warhol's images. So I do display all four of the images and use all four, but I try never to put them together as a set because you can't unsee that <laughs> and I don't want that sort of association with the pop art there. Um, so here's just some of the backing sheets. Um, these are just snapshots from my phone when I've been working, um, just to kind of show how some of the images look. Um, and then this is one of the scans. So this image here was the first one that I actually created. This was the first image that I kind of, I held that piece of acetate up to the light and I thought this is yeah, I've got something here that I can work with um, I think why these particularly work is they have this sort of Rorschach test uh, thing going on where people look at them and they see different things and they associate it with different things um, you know some people see this one as like fossils or sort of sea creatures um, and different people kind of look at them and take something different from each image. So I think they're quite effective in communicating with people in that way. Um, they also resemble satellite images. Um, a lot of them kind of have that look to them, especially this one. Now this is one where I've inverted the colors um, in Photoshop and this was one that was created from the acetate sheet. So you've kind of got the light coming through. And same with this as well. And then uh, another one, a lot of people see like a face in this one. Um, but again, it's kind of how people read them. But I like the, this one is from the backing sheet. It kind of looks more painterly. So I think you've got a lot more of the material. You can see like the textures in here. One of the ways I get the different colours in these images is experimenting with different lighting, coloured lighting, and also using uh, different films that were available. So um, the Impossible Project for a while, they did, you know, they did a black and white film that was available. They've done um, like a limited edition yellow and black film. I can't remember the name of it, but it was, they had like a white stripes association going on with it. And they did a, um, a cyan kind of cyan colored one and a magenta monochrome uh, film so I bought those as well to work with them and the actual backing paper is a different color on those so that's given me quite a lot of variety in the images as well um which way to skip one Here we go yeah so this is another one where you can actually see the chemistry and the texture on the on the uh, print And this one here, so we've got another one there, uh, which is uh, black and white. So for me, when I'm kind of working, one of the things I'm trying to uh, keep in mind is I'm trying to reduce the amount of uh, materials that I buy. Um, you know, I'm very aware that using this film is not sustainable. It's not eco-friendly. Um, 
and I think with Polaroid you you know you do only get a certain amount in the pack so um, you haven't got this sort of unlimited supply necessarily I mean you could buy a lot but I, I try and limit what I use and I'm very aware that at least I'm getting kind of four shots from one uh, one piece of film uh, so in my life as well outside of photography um, I work um, in a college part-time as a technician in the art department and I'm trying to constantly find ways that we can be less wasteful uh, so it's quite difficult when you're working and you're making your own work I think to try and balance um, and I know in my home life I'm really sort of aiming to try and become zero waste and you know I'm an environmental activist I'm involved in a lot of activism so it's hard trying to justify to yourself sometimes with photography how you're you know you're you're doing something that basically is causing some some damage and I think there's a lot of talk at the moment about sustainability and I think we need to be able to be regenerating not just kind of aiming to do less harm or even do no harm but we actually need to start working I believe at putting things back into the environment to make the environment better to make the world better um, so that's something I'm conscious of and trying to bring forward into work that I'm doing now and I'm looking more into uh, the possibility of other methods of producing work using natural materials and that may or may not involve photography so I'm feeling quite a lot of conflict I think as a photographer um, how can I you know be sustainable and how can I make work and how much work is okay to produce you know is a little bit okay is, is a lot okay so there's a lot of conflict so um, really really interested to hear what uh, the other photographers and the other people in this group have to say uh, today and the ones the last one about the, the silver gelatin uh, so the gelatin was really really useful to me because I'm someone who doesn't uh, eat meat and I don't use animal products and I've always kind of justified using gelatin as this byproduct so that talk uh, really made me rethink maybe about my uses of that as well um, so thank you hopefully if anybody's got any questions to ask later on <laughs> great thanks Hazel um that was really brilliant um yeah it would be really interesting maybe later in the questions to hear more about kind of your relationship as a environmental activist and yeah how that's maybe gonna hasn't influenced your work in the past but might influence it going forward um so next if we move on to Jem, if you're ready i am indeed yes I just had to lock the cat out. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you all for coming. Um, thanks, Hannah. Um, okay, so uh, Hannah asked us to kind of come along and talk a little bit about our practice and uh, time spent on the residencies as part of the Sustainable Darkroom uh, project which she, um, which she was leading. Um, so I will start. Um, Okay, so I work at the University of Oxford, as she said, at the Department of Plant Sciences, and there's a lot of plant research that goes on there. There's often a lot of quite exciting uh, scientific papers and things that come out, but often um, the, there's no visuals to sort of communicate it any further than the, than the actual papers themselves. And so I, I sort of started in my job um, sort of having to create that content uh, because I managed the web and social media there as part of my job. Um, so this is a sort of quite a, um, a common scene on the roof in one of the greenhouses. Um, there's lots of plants being grown for, the, for, for research um, and the, the scientists themselves, you know, they don't have much time to take photographs and they, they find the plants themselves a bit boring in, in some ways. Um, and so for me though, I, I, I just find the whole place incredibly fascinating. Uh, this is uh, rice growing under, um, under coloured LED lights and it's being forced. It's growing in a cannabis grow tent and I'm sort of crawling around in the tent taking photographs of it. But I think they all think I'm slightly mad. <laughs> but uh, I just think it, you know, it's just an incredible place to work. Um, and that, so that was, that was rice being forced and under stress and this is healthy rice growing uh, in the same tent but um, 
in slightly different conditions, under slightly different conditions. And then this, this is quinoa. Um, I hadn't actually seen quinoa being grown uh, until I worked where I, I work. I'd eaten it, obviously, but I hadn't seen it growing. It's actually quite a beautiful plant. It takes quite a long time to grow. Um, and then, you know, they're growing beans and, and so on. Uh, and that's quite commonplace there. Um, and some of the some of the researchers where I work uh, really embraced photography and I found that one of the researchers was was photographing the, the nodules on her um, pea roots and she was doing that because her research was very root focused and I was quite excited about how she was getting such good this is one of my images with the with the SLR but she was using her phone and um, she was in a, in a dark room environment using a blue LED lights and an orange filter and she was getting quite great quite great images to sort of communicate her science, um, but also to count the nodules physically. So it was quite a, uh, an important process in that respect. So I just, I don't know, I just wanted to show you some of the stuff going on there. Um, but for my project uh, on the MA at Falmouth, um, I really wanted to get into the university herbaria, which is across two floors, technically three floors. Um, and it's, it's sort of a mixture of, um, of a, of a library uh, in terms of books, but also there's pressed uh, dried specimens there um, from all over the world. And uh, you know, it's got millions of specimens there and it's, it's just an incredible place. It's, it's got um, kind of books and things dating back to the 15th century. And the curator was kind enough to say that I could spend six months uh, pestering him and going in and out of the herbarium uh, working there. And so I was, I was initially just looking at what was there and trying to work out a focus for my final project. And I was thinking, you know, with this vast collection, how on earth do I narrow that down and design a project and um, sort of e execute it practically and, and show it all within the six months of a full-time job. So um, I start, yeah, started looking and then I talked to a few academics uh, there and uh, I was given a few papers to read. Um, and one of these papers basically was was sort of highlighting how women are often underrepresented um, underrepresented um within science which we, we all probably know that probably across all fields but in botany in particular uh there was often a lot of important work that was done going back in time that wasn't uh recognized um Another, another person who's kind of key to this project and key to, has been key to my practice for quite a long time was Rosemary Wise and she wouldn't allow me to put a photograph up but she's a botanic illustrator where I work um, and she has illustrated more plant species than any other person on the planet and she's been doing this for over 50 years and her illustrations are scientifically accurate. I've called her an artist a few times and she's okay with that but really she's an illustrator. Um, and her work is overseen and, and reviewed by academic staff. It needs to be completely perfect in order to go into publications and so on. Uh, this was the paper I mentioned earlier, I've put it slightly out of sync, but um, it, it was really hard hitting for me. It was actually a, a male academic where I work, which I think is really quite special, that was, Jem, you really need to read these papers about women and how important they are in botany. Um, but it really stood out to me and it, it started to shape the project. Um, so as this kind of process of looking and, and sort of saying to the creator, I want to really focus in on women, he was bringing things out to show me and one of them was this, um, this plant souvenir. It's not, it's not scientific, it's, it really was a, a holiday souvenir, but I was just, I thought it was really beautiful. And he said he often doesn't get it out because people get so excited that uh, kind of the conversation ends there and they don't want to see anything else. Um, but I, I thought it was so beautiful and the, the materiality, I mean, the way it folds, it only folds one way, it's from 1850, it was probably made by women is what, is what he suspects because most seaweed specimens were. Um, it was one of the few things that Victorian women could do without their husbands was to go to the beach um, and to uh, kind of, they were unsupervised there. Um, I decided to have a go at making one myself. My plant pressing is much better now. I just like to point this out. But this took me hours, possibly days. I measured it all up and then remade it using plants from my mum's garden because she really is the reason that I'm so obsessed with plants. And I was showing the front and back features like you would in botanical illustration because the, the back's just as important, if not more, than the front. Um, and I was kind of going out into the field and I was looking for... Um, plants that were growing where they shouldn't 
uh, I don't like to use the word weeds too much, but, um, and obviously a poppy's not a weed, but things that were just kind of growing in the cracks in the interstices sort of on their own. Um, and I started collecting them first. And then I was making uh, cyanotype prints up on the roof. I uh, realized I could extend the exposures by, um, by basically using these, green, these glass, glass greenhouses uh, because the LED lights run overnight. They run pretty much on and off on, on cycles up to 24 hours at a time. Um, and so, yeah, I was using, using the space and putting a little sticky note for the researcher saying, if this needs to be moved, it's not a problem. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I was experimenting with photographic paper going back sort of 40 years or so. Um, uh, I was donated lots of paper by my friends here in Oxford and my, my uh, husband's father and that sort of thing. And so I was just using the, the waste plants, the plants that have been grown in, for harvest for seeds and so on, but then they, they, was, they were surplus to requirement. It really started to get me thinking about waste uh, and plant waste and um, I don't know, just kind of all the methods that are used within photography. And I, I don't know, I started to get a bit more concerned over time. I started to build up a timeline of these women. Uh, uh, there was a massive one. <laughs> and I thought, I've only got six months. I need to sort of strip this. I need to strip it back. So the people on the left, um, they are uh, people that were primarily um, sort of in the, in the botanic field in botany. Some were, were collecting and some were illustrating, making art. They were doing it primarily to make money. That was the focus or is the focus in Pia's case, who's still around. She's the same age as me. And then on the other side, they were doing it really for the love of it, uh, not necessarily to make, to make money. Not that the ones on the left don't love it, of course. Um, and I was developing these case studies, uh, which took quite a long time to get someone's life down to a postcard size. Um, and then this was me trying uh, to kind of pull my final major project together and think about what work I might select and um, kind of uh, pulling together a book. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, <laughs> there was quite a lot of stuff to shift through. I made a lot of work, pressed a lot of plants. Uh, you, you kind of get the gist. Um, and I was thinking, you know, how can I display a lot of these lumen prints uh, and cyanotypes? Uh, I, I didn't want to fix the lumens because I'd learned about, you know, kind of how the fix changes the images. And I really like the images before they're fixed. Uh, I don't really want the color to change. Uh, I also think it's quite special that they will degrade over time. So I was fixing them with a scanner and then putting them in a dark bag. I then went to London Centre for Book Arts and learned how to, to make my own book. Uh, and then I used herbarium uh, materials, which I became slightly obsessed with, still am, because they, they feel amazing, they smell amazing, the herbaria smells amazing. And I just really wanted to kind of show um, the work uh, sort of in context with all these amazing materials. Um, so here's a couple of images of the, of the book. Um, and then a little sneak peek inside, you can sort of see the whole book on the website, uh, I did a little video. But I was using like the glassine paper that you would use to protect photographs, but to also use a little in the, in the herbaria for various reasons and fragment and dissection packets. And I was uh, taking Rosemary's illustrations and I was making um, cyanotypes from digital negatives and just lots of experimentation with lots of different uh, processes. Um, I kind of also like this idea that the, yeah, these photographs are changing every time you view them, the light is degrading them and uh, they're kind of precious and magic of photography as Hazel said. Um, and so yeah, here's a little snapshot from in the herbaria where I had a, had a show, I gave a, a talk, then people came and saw the herbaria and saw some of my work, some of the women's work, some of Rosemary's work, Rosemary was there. Um, and then quickly, I'm probably talking too long, um, the sustainable darkroom residency was amazing and I'm really grateful to Hannah and, and everyone else for allowing me to be part of it, I'm going to embarrass uh, Hannah now. But um, this was the one that I was doing, um, which is the rework one, and we were yeah, we were, you probably all know about it already, but we were trying to find ways of, of looking at more sustainable ways of dealing with the, the waste chemistry um, uh, from, from the photographic process, um, plants in particular important. And so I started experimenting on this residency with anthotype process. This is um, basically emulsion made from dock leaves. Uh, I also experimented with, um, with using the plant honesty 
and the different sort of emotions we can get from that because surprisingly I hadn't actually made amphotypes. Um, I'd always meant to get around to it but hadn't so it was really nice to have a week to be able to have, have a bit of creative play and fun and learn something new. So, um, and then we were also experimenting with Carol Dewing's um, photography um, and so I was, I was sort of playing with that um, and you can see what happens when you put when you put the photographic paper into the fix it just upsets me every time because for me I just like these unfixed, unfixed images um, and so this is kind of pre-fix and, and post-fix um, and I, I do prefer them on the left. And then Alice who was part of the residency I was on made these really incredible prints using agar um, and cyanotype chemistry and I was just so inspired I, I thought I wonder whether I could do something similar using spirulina uh, which is like a another kind of algae uh, powder that you put in smoothies and so on. And so I just had a bit of a play and yeah, it's not, it's not as beautiful as Alice's amazing work, but she really inspired me to kind of get out of my garden and just, um, yeah, experiment and, uh, and just see what could be done. So yeah, I was quite amazed to be able to make an image from, from using just plants, two types of al algae. Um, yeah, and this is some of the spirulina experiments, um, which, yeah, it's really quite fast, actually, the exposure time is short. And then, yeah, I just put this little picture at the end just to say I had such a great week. I really enjoyed um, kind of being with everybody and meeting such lovely people. Um, and, yeah, I'd, I don't know, I, it was a great experience. So, And very finally, sorry, because I've talked a lot, um, I had this idea, you probably know a little bit about Quarantine the Rare if you follow William and John and me, but I had this idea that it would be really nice during lockdown to send out cyanotype packs to the people because obviously everyone sort of was trapped inside, it was quite early on and I knew how much I enjoyed the process and then I chatted to John and John had had the same idea and then I chatted to William and he had the same idea and actually all of our ideas fit really well together and the project's really expanded and I think that's due to collaboration um, and similar interests and it's become much richer because of that collaboration, because of that working together. My original idea was just this kind of scruffy mind map which I think I pinged over to John and Williams like this could be fun and they were like I'm already thinking of doing this and then it was like should we get together um, and we've got uh, a lot of people participating I can't even remember how many uh, William and I can always talk about it later but uh, William also is just amazing at getting funding and he's been working really hard to to get us funding for the project and I know John's been applying for money as well just so we can extend this to more people. But we would really welcome participation from people with their own materials, which I'm sure you all have. Um, it's just quite a nice, uh, it's quite a nice thing to do. And that's it, enough for me. <laughs> Thank you for listening. That was great, Gem, thanks so much. Um, so then we'll move on to William, if you're ready. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, yeah, that was some wonderful talk. Thank you. And um, Jen's much too modest about everything. It's really wonderful to see all of that. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to do in front of a screen, to be completely honest. Um, I'm giving an online talk such as this. So I prepared a video yesterday um, about my work, Suburban Herbarium, which obviously has its kind of clear overlaps in what Jem's interested in is sort of why we've become sort of collaborators and friends um, so I am going to put this video on the more I think about it the more sort of ridiculous and goofy this thing seems that I've made so you pre-record it I'm going to be talking to you about my new book Suburban Herbarium and we're going to have a look at some of the prints from the series and I'll take you on a little walk around and we'll look at some of the weeds from which the photographs in this book are derived. The photographs were made over a period of five years on a regular lunch break walk that I make from the college where I work as a technician and teacher of photography. Um, the cover, which you can see here, utilises a photograph from an earlier series of work made on these walks using a large format camera and caffeinol developer um, made with the coffee from the staff room. 
Uh, we decided on this for the cover because I think it gives a good indication as to the kind of place where these, these plants come from. Um, it's published by Uniform Books um, and contains a very nice foreword by author and naturalist Mark Cocker and an essay on where the work sits within a wider field of history of botanical photography by Professor Val Williams. Um, the initial sort of inspiration for making this work came simply out of making the walks uh, for a long time. Um, I've, I've had this job for an embarrassingly long time for, and I've been out at lunchtime uh, trying to find some interest in what perhaps at face value is not the most interesting sort of place. It's um, so lots of identical housing, business park, a sort of very modern college facility, and not really the kind of place where one might necessarily go to seek out, I guess maybe the exotic or kind of a wilderness place. But I've really been influenced a great deal by writers like Richard Mavey and much older writers like Richard Jeffries, who talk about these kind of fringe places that aren't um, countryside and then they aren't town either. So you hear them called Edgeland or it's my bastard countryside. So in short it's about finding the wonder in the overlooked and particularly about plants, about this other important idea um, that you might have referred to as plant blindness, which is to do with um, sort of a, a cognitive impairment where people are really only concerned with animal species. There's a zoological bias in conservation. It's quite hard to make people interested in plants often. And so this work is about elevating the status of these, these weeds and hopefully persuading people to think about the importance of where this sits in a, a robust ecosystem. Um, so I think the best thing to do here might be just to take a look at the book. So the next camera angle you'll see will be the book. I hope that works for you. It's one of the Lords and Ladies. It's one of my favourites. Looks almost like a charcoal drawing. And so we can go on and, and on. So um, you might be interested to know a little bit about how these are made. Um, as I mentioned, I, I work at the college as a technician and teacher of photography. Um, and as such, I have access to Christ dark room. So plants, so I pick them up lunchtime and then they're kept in, in water so they're fresh and I normally don't have time to print them there and then and then later in the day in the evening I'll, I'll make prints. Um, so this is these this is what the actual prints look like. So you can see that very well there. I'll just hold it, hold it up. So they're all 12 by 16 inches or the same on fiber based paper. Um, Ilford matte fiber based paper. They are what you call projection photograms, I suppose. So the actual plant specimen is placed, let's take this, uh, this 
Sage from the Cup Towers here. Um, so the planned specimens would be like this, and then they'll be sandwiched between two bits of glass on the 10 by 8 inch negative carrier, and then the enlarger will be switched on, and the plant will be projected onto the baseboard, and then the prints made in the conventional way. Sage, nice. Um, prints made in the conventional way, test strip, and all the rest. So, what you end up with, as opposed to a contact print photogram, is lots of extremely fine detail. So, when I put this together later on, I will put some of the prints up just on the screen so you can see the details and just how, how fine they are. Um, what I might do is switch back to the other angle and I'll show you some of the real things. And then after I've shown you some of the real things, I'd quite like to actually maybe we'll go outside, the weather's nice, mm, it seems tragic to be in here doing this so I can maybe, it's not the suburbs, so I live in the countryside, which has been very fortunate during this time, but I'll maybe find some scraggy areas where we can look at some of the weeds that there's some prints on here, and I'll talk about them a little bit, and then in the final edit screen, which you'll be watching, you can see the prints, with the weeds and the information. I hope that works out nicely. Okay, so I hope this isn't a terrible angle and that you can see. Um, so I'm just going to leaf through some of the original prints. Um, I should say, I mean, they're, all, they're all unique prints. Um, I only make one. Um, of the occasional test, and this is how they've been stored. So it's fantastic now to have them in, in book form because at present they just exist in portfolio boxes like this. So cesium dense, so it's a common thistle, oxide daisies, red clover, some meadow sweet, which is an interesting plant, sort of very strongly aromatic um, was used actually apparently to as a kind of material on, on floors at one time or the speed wells um, common field speed well blackberry brambles rubus fructicosus um, there are I think something like 260 different kinds of blackberry bramble amazingly Lesser celandine, also known as pile wart, um, apparently it has some, some uh, positive effects upon that condition, which I haven't personally, can personally vouch for that. Dog rose. So there are all of these just incredibly beautiful, but very, very common plants. Wood cranes bill. Santa Barbara daisy. A common ornamental wall plant that's widely naturalized, especially in Cornwall. Um, this is quite an interesting one of the navel wart, the little succulent uh, round plants you have to find on, on walls. Blackthorn, which is a, just finished blossoming, it was amazing this spring. Solana, the nightshade, the bittersweet nightshade. Um, as you can see here, we can see the little seeds in the projection which look very much like well, tomato seeds from the same family. Common ash, heart's tongue fern. This is uh, just before it unfurls. And the hedge wound wart, which um, the name suggests was was once used for making poultices for, for wounds. Uh, these ones are in their protective sleeves, so we won't get those out, but I'll just leave through a few more. Enchanter's Nightshade, Tuberous Comfrey, Prunus Avium, Wild Cherry, Avium, because the birds like them so much. Dead nettles, water mint, 
understand it and go on and on and on. So there are 100 in the book, I think in total, maybe there are over 130 or so of these prints. So the next thing as promised, we're going to go outside and we're going to look at some of these, these weeds for real and where they grow. And before we go outside here, where I live in the countryside, I think it'd be useful just to watch this old time-lapse video from a talk I gave a couple of years ago, which gives more of an indication of the actual habitat where these weeds come from. Um, at the moment it will probably look rather more picturesque, but it's a nice day, although I've tried as hard as I can to try and find the uh, sorts of areas, um, like neglected areas, where these things that happen. I think in the end you might catch a little glimpse of me setting up for a print. There we go. Um, what's that? So you see just to the right of the frame there, the oxide daisy, the one that uh, describes almost like a child's drawing of a flower. So the introduced common landscaping plant, but they're actually highly invasive. So um, we'll look here um, and then we'll go and look at my neighbour Simon's flower bed where he's uh, maybe put less time into reading some of them out and we'll see how they've taken over. So you'll see this hasn't been re for several years and Oxide daisies have completely taken over. Um, maybe in the flower, they look incredible actually. But okay, so a less picturesque area here where we might find something more akin to the environment. So one we'll all recognise and we've all probably had run-ins with while wearing shorts and sandals, um, Urtica diurica, a common stinging nettle, um, all parts of which actually are edible and it's highly nutritious. Um, use a spinach substitute, makes a nice tea. Um, it's actually quite an important food plant um, for in the life cycle of peacock butterflies and small tortoiseshell butterflies. But it's hugely prolific, occurs anywhere where there's human habitation. Real mix of species in this neglected corner. See the stinging nettle, narrow leaf dock, flat of brambles, creeping buttercups, lots of them, herb robert, various grasses, which I don't pretend to know about, some elm suckers, the cleavers. And two very common weeds here in this rubble. You see the um, red campion quite obviously, and also the forget me not. I think it's wood forget me not, much lower down, along with more herb robber. Um, red campion is one plant, and you can find it at absolutely any time of the year in Cornwall, but it's in huge profusion in the hedges in May as we are now. So, again, this is. Um, much like some of the building sites where the specimens for suburban herbarium were collected. So we have the herb robert here, which is in the geranium family, many names. Stinking cranes, but very pungent. I only read somewhere it's supposed to be a um, potential rabbit repellent, but I don't get to see any evidence of that. Um, so then it's uh, death come quickly and stinky bob. So another weed with culinary potential actually, garlic mustard or jack by the hedge, Aliaria petiolata, which I've served often and it's a little bit bitter to actually use, but it's um, a very common weed of April. Apparently in America it's an invasive species and they're trying to eradicate it, just grows like uh, anything else. So. 
just a little gone over now. And here we can see the uh, oilseed rape, common agricultural crop, growing to an impressive size as a weed. Hiding in amongst the ornamental beans is a um, common fumatory. Well, I hope everyone's had a nice time looking at a few weeds and any questions. So I think that's going to follow up now with Hannah chairing and also Gem and I will talk about the quarantine herbarium Lanto project. And thanks for watching. I hope it was in some way useful. Oh, so hopefully the sound was all right on that. Yeah, I hope it was. I thought it would just be nice to see some of the actual plants and kind of where they live and then the prints side by side would be a... It was a real treat to see some yeah. countryside weeds in their natural habitat. I hope so. It kind of, it felt a little bit like cheating because the place where, where they're actually made is sort of, is this kind of like boring sort of nowhere place. But obviously I live on a farm and it's really quite nice currently so but I don't know hopefully it was uh, yeah good to see the specimens anyway and a lot of things something the thing that I'm interested in about kind of these like suburbs kind of edgeland places is often this like real mix of plants that grow where you get kind of invasive species garden escapees growing next to wild plants and then also to think about the sort of the politics of that in terms of how we think about conservation, in terms of are we conserving often what we like as opposed to what is maybe useful in, in making kind of robust ecosystems and like where does one draw the line between kind of like what's an invasive species and what's just something that's thriving. Um, just for instance, say take something like the honeybee, which is um it's, it is an invasive non-native species in the in the northern in north america but one would never ever think of that as being an invasive species because it's successful and it's really useful and we like it so there's a lot that kind of comes down to usefulness um, aesthetics and all sorts it's just something that interests me particularly so yeah, quite interesting it's interesting to see interesting that we place such you know negative terminology around certain plants when they're growing when we don't want them to grow you know they suddenly become something mm. really aggressive and invasive and all these words which are possibly quite unnecessary because it's all relational yeah absolutely i mean obviously i mean some invasive species truly are dreadful and it can lead to biodiversity loss but also, there's this whole kind of something that strikes me as almost like a mirror image of some of the language that you hear surrounding kind of immigration debates with human populations that you hear in. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's something, I haven't got the answers, but it's something that's, that I'm interested in. Yeah, and is that something that you and Gem are also kind of trying to tackle with Quarantine Herbarium? Uh, yeah, a little. I think, I mean, the quarantine herbarium is about, like, I guess, like finding the wonder in the overlooked. And when the lockdown period started, people were obviously forced to be at home and forced to pay attention to what was kind of in front of them and find kind of find something interesting to do or or go mad. So I guess sending out um, sending out the papers to people. I mean, initially, I think, I mean, Jem, again, being like, too modest, saying it was a scrappy idea. My idea really didn't extend much further than sending out a bunch of cyanotype sheets to some students and maybe seeing if some other people wanted to do it. And then it's, as we've been working together, it's turned into more of a kind of proper cohesive project. And it's been, yeah, really good. Yeah, and like um, Hazel said earlier, you know, there have been a lot of people, I think, kind of turning to like more alternative forms of printing during this period because you know things like cyanotypes and lumen prints are so accessible 
it's really nice to suddenly yes see people get back in touch with kind of the plants in their garden and printing mm. with them and how this can be used and I think there have been quite a few cyanotype projects kind of floating around um, during our time in isolation from in different areas. I think there was one up in Scotland and um, but I think most of them have been a bit more general of just sending people the paper and you know anything comes back but I think it's quite interesting that yours has a specific focus on kind of paying closer attention to vegetal life or weeds or it's possibly has a bit more of a scientific aspect to it I don't know if you would agree with that or yeah I, I think I think we probably would both agree on that and um you kind of it's uh it is a big problem uh plant blindness is a big issue I I um I have a I have a whatsapp group actually with my work colleagues and we're in plant sciences but a lot of them are not really interested in plants the support the support team for the academics there and um you know quite often one of uh, our photographers he he uh, will share beautiful photographs of his his garden where he's locked you know he's locked down he's furloughed and a lot of the team will say oh that's really nice and i'll come back and i'll i'll try and identify it and i'll give them like, the latin name and the common name and stuff and he'll go very well done Jim, because <laughs> his wife's uh, really into gardening and she gardens at one of the colleges and then one of my classmates came back and was like yeah, Jem, what she said, uh, red plant. <laughs> and he, he actually, you know, and, 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 and it's become like a running joke because so many people that I know of the younger generation can, can look at something and say it's nice, but they have no idea what kind of plant it is. And I think I'd really taken that for granted for a long time and just assumed that everybody knew about plants. And then kind of the more I sort of got into my project, the more sort of discussing with the curator and talking to, looking at Will's projects and talking to William and stuff. I mean, I think it, it is quite a serious project problem and it's not just actually plants it's wildlife as well um kind of the knowledge is being lost uh, across generations um uh, it's kind of not being passed on <laughs> yeah relating it to wilderness in general or wilderness or animals there was um a really nice quote from the guy who wrote the um I don't know if it's a pretext or something to your book, Will, Subarian Herbarium, about the um, like number of people that are part of the like bird preservation in comparison mm. to the number of people that are part of the plant, the equivalent kind of plant preservation. And one was yeah. in the millions. So the birds preservation is like in the millions, and then the plant one is like eleven thousand or something. You know? Yeah. Really without one we don't have the other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's definitely a big a big issue that uh what is it they say where I work, uh when they're trying to sort of recruit uh people to the BA in biology, they said that they and when they're when they're actually on course and they're looking to decide on their major projects, they, they tend to think that animals are sexy and plants are boring. And it just makes me so sad <laughs> because that's definitely not the case. But you know, kind of if you've got the a, pl a plant or you've got um, a penguin or a lion it's, uh, it's mm. well it's so easy to anthropomorphize animals and put a narrative upon them in a way that with plants is is not really is not really so easy it's um yeah i don't know how i don't know how you do that so. I, I strongly believe that um in order to protect what we have in nature people need to know about it it's very difficult for anybody to be bothered if, uh, you know, we've lost so many species, um, you know, in recent years and people don't, they don't really care or they don't, because they don't know about it. But, you know, if suddenly like something we recognized and we were really familiar with and we were used to seeing every day was gone, I think people would, would fight for it more. Whereas, you know, it's very easy now for like, um, with HS2 for this ancient woodland to be destroyed. And a lot of people, don't understand the significance of it because they don't recognize the difference between different types of trees or the age of trees or the habitat it provides and you know the mosses and the fungi and the soil and the whole ecosystem and I think in order to get people to protect things they have to know about them um, and I think your works both of you is really interesting because you know it's highlighting these plants that people probably see a lot and they wouldn't know the name for it and I think that's 
probably you know the first part of looking after our natural world is to be able to identify things mm. absolutely and i think something that really i just have to quickly try then there's something that really excited me on the residency was you know kind of seeing people um coming up with lots of different recipes for plant-based developers and sort of seeing how well that works and sort of you know kind of everything that you've echoing everything you've just said hazel but also then applying it to um, phot phot analog photography, which is just so pumped full of chemicals. Um, uh, and and I, I don't know, I think it's just gone to highlight even further that, you know, to a, maybe to quite a broad audience, the residency has done, I think, quite a good job of communicating that. And I think, um, I think there's going to be a recipe book. Are we allowed to say that, Hannah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, there will. Yeah, there will at some point be another publication which will include lots of recipes, a kind of recipe book section from all the plants that everybody was experimenting with. Um, I'm now going to open up to questions from all of our um, audience because we've got a very vociferously wonderful chat in the side ground. Um, <laughs> And Anthony is asking where we can get a copy of your book, Will. So if you want to answer that first. Oh, yeah. And it's easiest just to get it direct from the publisher at the moment, because obviously bookshops aren't really going, or some of them are. But it's, yeah, that's the best way. Um, cool. So, so we've got a question, I think, to everybody. Um, asking how do you feel about removing samples from the environment so yeah that's um that's a good question um it's something that's actually we've been considering and really trying to re-emphasize with the quarantine herbarium is that people aren't supposed to go on like a strip mining mission and not to uproot wild plants um, I guess ultimately it comes down to a question of whether or not one considers kind of raising the status and awareness of these plants above maybe the one or two plants that you're cutting to take back and make a print as whether whether that's worthwhile. Obviously some species are protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act from 1981. So for instance, I mean it's completely illegal to go out and like pick bluebells and certain kinds of orchids. You're just not allowed to do it although i mean the law as it stands is just that you you are not allowed to pick wild flowers to make a profit you are technically allowed to pick them for your own pleasure although obviously it wouldn't really be very good i don't think personally to go and build yourself a big posy of wild flowers that could just be looking nice in the hedgerow and providing all the benefits they do but yeah it, it's a it's a balance um and I think being responsible and being aware that you're not necessarily uprooting something that's kind of rare. I think that's as, sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but that's as well as I could put that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And what about the um, gem? What about you? What about picking plants that are in the herbarium or in the university? Uh, sort of like an army of people su sort of supporting the plants being grown. And then so you've got like the dried, the dried specimen in the in the herbaria um, and then you've also got uh, the greenhouse technicians growing um, model plants for research on the roof and, and some of the PhD students and research are growing them as well but there's sort of um, with certain plants that are sort of considered yeah stock stock plants so Arabidopsis I used a lot which um, is Thale Cress which is arguably the most important uh, plant in, uh, in plant science because it's this model plant that goes from seed to seed in six weeks. It's, it has sex with itself. It's such a cool plant. It's a weed. I love it. And everyone in the department thinks it's very boring. I mean, they, they know it's incredibly powerful and important for science, but it, it's just, it, it's prolific. You sort of see it everywhere. And to them, they've almost become blind to it because they work with it all the time. And and so they're sort of, they're, they're growing it all the time as, as stock for people to, to work with. Um, and oftentimes there's too much of it, it's a surplus and it grows so well and it will get really leggy and then it will go to the autoclave because plants are used for research purposes for, 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 for growing and they're very much looking at tackling food security where I work. That's a big issue, making sure that we, um, we, <laughs> they, can can feed the world uh, down downstream. That's a government priority. That's where a lot of the funding is going, and um, 
but you know there is waste uh, and it does all go tend to go down the water play route because you know there is some gm research that's being done and people feel differently about that but it's um it's not being done for fun it's important um but yeah i was i was sort of rescuing a lot of these leggy plants these leggy weeds and then using prints. sorry that was a long answer. cool yeah so it's almost the opposite you know you're not uh -huh. removing something that's growing you're kind of saving something from yeah in the bin yeah <laughs> Cool. So another question we've got from Taros is, can you recommend any good sources for botanical news? Will. Yeah, really. I mean, mostly I just follow several Twitter accounts. There's the British and Irish Botanical Society, which I put their, their, um, their Twitter handle up. They're really good and they've got such a wide following that they're particularly good if you need an ID on a plant. You can put it on Twitter and someone will someone will tell you what it is with some degree of certainty. Um, actual news, I don't really know. Maybe Jem, in your position, you might be better to answer that. Um, I mean, <laughs> come and follow Oxford Plant Sciences. Um, <laughs> But uh, follow the herbaria. Um, there's this really exciting thing going on at the moment called um, that, that's celebrating the 400 years of the sort of the herbaria in plant sciences. And um, our herbaria curators writing little features on um, plants and then pushing them out every week. And they were being um, also printed and put in the common rooms. So people could read them over their coffee and so on. But um, it's all published. I can stick a link in the chat. Um, they also have like a plant systematics uh, um, publication, which is really good. Um, I'm going to try and get quarantine herbarium in there. Um, but no, um, I will have a think on that actually, and maybe pass it on to on to Hannah. But there definitely are there definitely are um, lots of sources. I just can't think of any at the moment. Uh, and the um, hashtag the, the wildflower hour. They're actually it's, it's a separate account now, but that hashtag in particular there's a thing every Sunday between eight and nine o'clock where you sort of you put up your best wild flower that you found that week. I actually got into mild trouble with them last week because I put up this picture of, um, it's called Bastard Balm. It's like a really horrible name, but it's, uh, it's in the dead nettle family. It looks like a nettle. It's got quite a pretty purple flower. It got like 200 odd likes, which seems to be a lot on Twitter. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to have a little bit of cheeky promo of my book here. And they really told me off for it. Oh dear. Yeah, but otherwise it's great. <laughs> the hashtag wildflower hour you find something yeah but no don't try and promote anything otherwise you'll be told off very sternly okay <laughs> um so cornelius asked if we could expand a bit more on the development of film with caffeinol or other things that can be found at home in lockdown um so this was something that we researched quite extensively during the remove week of the residency um and so plant-based developers can essentially be made with we found a, nearly all plants it's kind of basically worth just you see a plant that you have quite a lot of give it a go and it might make a plant-based developer um you're then mixing your plant material with uh vitamin c and washing soda um so basically the combination of those three creates the right uh chemical balance for your film to develop um we've got a basic there are lots of basic caffeinol recipes online that you can find um and if you just substitute your instant coffee for um plant material which we have found is best to be um steeped overnight in liquid and then you strain it and you use that liquid as your kind of base developer and then you're adding your um vitamin c and washing soda to it um will made some really successful um paper developers i don't think you tried any film but you tried it quite extensively with positive paper um, yeah i mean they were, I was just going to search for the Instagram links, but I've got the box on the desk here. I don't know how well you can see them, but that's, I mean, that's willow developed in, in willow, basically substituting the plants, as you just mentioned, for the coffee element of caffeinol. 
um, mint worked really well. I mean, they've all got this stain on, it depends like what the plant is. Some, sometimes the stain's heavier than others. So what I was looking for was really something with a kind of relatively light stain because um, I mentioned about the cover of the Suburban Herbarium book being, it was that was direct positive paper developed in Cathanol. Um, there are sort of, like it was a little bit of a kind of like a jokey thing about kind of I'll get, trying to seek this wilderness while I'm stuck at work and there's this horrible stimulant in the staff room that I can use to make a developer from. So it was kind of about, yeah, about work and leisure and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I'd like to find one. I think they do work better as film developers. They're not particularly good as paper developers. So I think if I did develop film, I just haven't done it, it would work, it would work better. But that's ribwort plantain that was successful. So I mean, as someone said, oh, about kind of um, lockdown activities, it was really great to be on that residency in the first sort of weeks of lockdown, and yeah, just to obviously lucky to be in the countryside with a vegetable garden and having these things growing. So it was yeah, super fun to black out the bathroom and get a bicycle light out as the safe light and do all of these things. Yeah, I'd just like to say, echoing that, that it's really Hannah's fault that I now have a darkroom of my own in my house. Uh, <laughs> I've got my own sustainable darkroom. And I meant to put some pictures in the slides, but I, I've put it on, on Instagram anyway. But um, I'm really quite excited about that. I don't think that I'd have had the kind of confidence to get cracking with that. And I've made some Willow developer. I haven't used it yet. But, um, but yeah, thanks to, to you, Hannah, and to everybody involved, and also Will for the recipe and things. It's been, um, it's been awesome. And also the saturated salt fixer. So if anyone has, has seen or read about that, it's really excellent too. So, and, and yeah, I've been kind of not using, I'm sure a lot of people don't use stock anyway, chemical stock, I just use water. So there's lots of ways of kind of making your um, you're developing and your printing process more friendly, uh, environmentally friendly. <laughs> or vinegar, if you really insist on stop, would yeah. be the same. Oh yeah. Yeah. So another question, quickly one for all of you from Poppy is: What projects are you working on currently? Um, at the moment, I've been doing Lumen prints. Uh, I seem to have like an inordinate amount of um, expired paper like boxes and boxes and boxes. So I've been doing that. Um, I've done some uh, pinhole cameras. Um, once we went into lockdown, I decided that I was going to do some oscillography and leave the cameras up until um, until we come out of lockdown, kind of till there, there feels like we can, you know, safely return. And it's just kind of this, you know, this visual calendar, I guess, of the sun passing of, over those days. Um, I've got another idea which I'm hatching, which actually fits in a bit with Will and Jem's kind of work, which is actually to um, create something where I've got an image on paper and to work on some sort of paper that can be um, potentially like embedded with seeds. You know, I was talking before about how I felt that things needed to be regenerative. So I had this idea of making images onto some paper that once the image was done with could potentially be, you know, returned to the earth and maybe grow some some seeds from that so it's something i was just playing around with and i've just been researching at the moment different uh methods to make paper with natural materials cool great yeah. jen do you want to talk briefly for yeah. your i won't ramble on too long <laughs> but yeah um i have been um been meaning to experiment with this willow developer that i've made you have the recipe from the dark from the sustainable dark room um i also um i had this idea during the residency and then ran out of time and, and work day job and things but um of sort of trying to substitute a the agar uh, that i was using and maybe have a go at using some um carrageen kappa which is like another another alternative to gelatin. Uh, I want to see if I can have a go at, at using that um, to create to create the um, agar substitute and then uh, use the spirulina again, whisk that in again to try and make, an, make a different type of image. Just see if it's, I don't know if it's going to be as stable. Um, um, also kind of 
quarantine herbarium is taking a bit of our time at the moment, which is and then I, I kind of want to get into the herbarium as soon as possible. Um, the curator keeps sort of sending me things that he thinks I might like to look at when I get back, including some glass plate negatives of Oxford in the 1800s. But I, I would like to continue this woman in botany uh, research uh, very much so. So, yeah. <laughs> Fab. And then lastly, Will, what are you up to? Yeah, I'm doing a couple of things. So I'm doing, I mean, a long term sort of project on the area where I live um, called Nance Kook, which is on the one hand quite picturesque and lovely countryside. On the other hand, from the 1950s to the late 70s, just up the road, there was um, an outpost of Porton Down. Basically, it was like the epicentre of Britain's chemical warfare development project. So this old disused airbase where they manufactured sarin gas and VX. Um, there are lots of rumours that when it was shut down in the late 70s that this stuff was inappropriately disposed of and went down mine shafts. Um, now they grow cauliflowers on the site. So I've been making some work to do with cauliflowers and this sinister airbase that exists. So it's quite it's some quite like conventional documentary photography along with some sort of more, I guess, like quite wacky stuff, plaster casts of cauliflowers and odd things. And my partner, Molly, she's um, an artist and a chef, and she's been devising kind of various kind of like thematic meals that go around this. The other thing I'm doing is called Some Interesting Apples, and that links back to kind of ideas of biodiversity and conservation and I guess subjectivity of taste whether or not we conserve things that we like or whether we conserve things that are particularly useful so there's some interesting apples thing I shared a link to the Instagram earlier which is just the typology of apples is we're mapping wild apples so I don't know how much people know about apples but basically uh, apples can't be grown from seed well they can that's all apples come from seeds at one point but to get an apple of a particular variety you have to grow it by a graft if you grow an apple from a seed it will not be the same variety as the apple that the seed came from it's always something different much like people so the thing is this makes them very very specious there's like loads and loads and loads and loads of different apple varieties just growing on like waste ground in hedges absolutely everywhere and because they're so diverse they're potentially quite important for food security, thinking about climate change and how some things basically will stick and some things will not stick and apples are kind of maybe interesting in that regard. But yeah, like because there's so many different types. So we're mapping wild apples, we're building a database, myself and another artist, James Ferguson, that is. And then we're going to graft these apples onto two trees that have already been planted. They're going to be the good apple tree and the bad apple tree. It's with an arts organisation called Kessel Barton. We're going to have a public tasting of all of the apples we find from these like wayside apple trees and people will be able to decide if they're bad or good. And we will be grafting using this basically you splice a bit of tree onto a bit of tree and it grows. So I've been practising with that, splicing, grafting my own apple trees at home. So we'll have a good apple tree with all the things that people think are lovely and a bad apple tree tree with all the things that people think are horrible but which will be very absurd but hopefully making that quite a serious point about biodiversity and yeah so kind of how aesthetics and yeah comes into conservation matters so that's that and if you want to follow the thing of lots of different apples all to scale on a black background i've shared the link for that that was really great. You have to um, invite us all along to the event at Castle Barton. Yes, it's not. It's not obviously. It's not happening now. It's supposed to be in yeah. September, but luckily we have got a little bit of um, like emergency ACE money to carry on the research for it. So hopefully next year it will. Great. It will happen. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Um. So we just had um. Someone asking if you tasted all the apples on the uh, on the account on the <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, yeah I have um, again with my partner we've had lots of like tasting evenings back in the autumn um, some of them have been really good the problem with a lot of those on the account so far is they're actually known specimens some are wild um, 
lots of them are just kind of like heritage varieties and I got a lot from this one particular apple day at a national trust point they've been sat around for weeks on end so some of them were disgusting so I don't know if the taste tests were as good as they could be so um, yeah I'm hoping this autumn to get my hands on more fresh specimens although particularly I'm really just interested in the feral like the wild specimens that grow from the seeds rather than the known ones but yeah yeah I have tasted them all as a range of uh, range of results good so thank you so much everyone for joining us um it was really nice to have such a um a generous crowd with all your comments and questions it was really a delight to have all three of you speaking this evening um so yeah that's all hopefully you'll all be able to join us for next month for our next set of talks um i haven't set the date yet but i will let you know when it's when it's in the calendar.